Great, thanks. So uh, just as a short, quick reference for the last presentation, actually my colleague Robert Stiegler is, um, I think, in the background. Um, maybe he can um, talk a little bit about the previous presentation and the measurements. Um, I don't know if he's aware of that. So, but for now, um, um, today I want to speak more about the measurement-based black box harmonic stability analysis of um, commercially available single phase photovoltaic inverters. So um, we're actually looking from the device perspective into the network and want to see how these um, PV inverters become stable or instable based on the, um, based on the network impedance. So this is just the short agenda for today. So I'll of course give a brief introduction and then we will come to the theory of the black box stability analysis in general. Uh, later, we will um, take a look at the probabilistic stability assessment with regard to the network impedance and different inverters. And of course, I'll give a short conclusion. So um, what are we seeing currently in the network is basically to pursue the climate goals. We see a replacement of traditional central energy um, towards renewable energies that are typically connected by power electronic devices, such as inverters, for example. So the challenges that we have to face is basically if we use these power electronic devices, we see a reduction of damping loads and at the same time an increase of non-linearities due to the behavior of these power electronic devices. So as a consequence, we actually have a high penetration of inverters in the grid and it will probably even increase in future when we look at battery storage systems, EV chargers, and of course, photovoltaics. So what has happened in the past is actually that we see unwanted shutdowns of photovoltaic inverters in the grid. And the problem we also have is that we have a large diversity of these inverters, which means that they all have a different behavior due to the different design, because of course they're manufactured by multiple manufacturers and they all have a different design approach. So what we are talking about is typically a very complex and usually unknown design of the circuit and the controls, so to say, for example, the software in general. And at the same time, also all these devices interact with each other. So what we're talking today or what I want to explain a little bit in the following is actually the prediction of unstable inverter conditions based on the network impedance. So what we're typically doing is um, we have a, um, a, sorry, okay. So we're having a, um, we are performing a black box stability analysis, which we can also call impedance based analysis um, because we're looking at impedance as black box means uh, for to say that we have no knowledge about the internal structure and we also don't require information about the parameters. So the entire procedure is measurement based and we identify impedance, um, let's say the impedance characteristic only on our measurements and maybe a little bit of a generic uh, behavior that we know in general about PV inverters. We consider the electric impedances of the network end of the um, inverters. And we have to admit that this is only suitable for small signal analysis, analysis. So we're talking about the frequency range above 50 Hertz up to two kilohertz. So the harmonic frequency range. On the right side, you can see the small signal model. So we have an inverter side and the grid side. So we represent in this study the grid by a network impedance, a frequency dependent network impedance and a background voltage. And on the left side, you see the inverter side where we assume that we can represent the inverter by a current source and the respective admittance, or let's say in this picture, it's actually an impedance of the inverter. And how do we perform the stability analysis? Well, we um, look at the Nyquist criterion which has basically two parts. So when we're looking at the gain margin, simplified speaking, we can detect the um, ratio of the grid impedance and the network imp uh, and the inverter impedance. And when they intersect, we're looking at the phase margin and the system is supposedly stable if uh, 180 degrees minus uh, the network impedance phase angle plus the inverter phase angle is above zero. So it's bigger than zero. So this is basically the theory. Of course, um, we wanted to double check the theory in the laboratory. So let me briefly introduce the measurement setup that we have chosen. Um, on the top picture, you can see the test stand setup. So basically what we can do is we can affect the voltage at the point of connection 
when we change basically the test stand impedance that is connected between our voltage generator with a background voltage and the inverter. And now in practice, the problem is a little bit that it can be very pricey to actually have such an impedance for higher power ratings. So what we did is actually we used air coils and we can change now the test stand impedance when we move the air coils apart. So this equation L test equals L1 plus 2M plus L2 actually reflects this. So L1 and L2 is a fixed inductance that we have based on the air coils that we use. But if we change the distance, the geometric distance between those two air coils, the magnetic coupling here represented by two amps will actually change. So that our L test actually changes and consequently also our Z test. So this is a very flexible and cost-efficient design where we can still change an RL equivalent basically at our test stand um, to test different conditions. So we actually defined three test cases. So the first test case on the left is the table. Um, the first test, ten, test case is basically when we apply an inductance of zero millihenry. So this reflects actually an ideal um, network. So we assume a stable inverter operation and only very little distortion. When we're talking about the second test uh, case, we actually applied inductance that is when we look at typical networks already much too high, but with regard to the theoretic analysis that we performed for our inverter, this is still, um, let's say, a reasonable network impedance for the inverter to work properly. So we expect a stable operation of the inverter, but a very noticeable high distortion caused by the interaction of the inverter with this uh, test stand impedance. Sorry. Um, so basically, when we're talking about um, test case three, of course, we wanted to see that the inverter actually shuts down. So our expecta expectation was an instable behavior of the water and a shutdown. Here is actually the formula represented where we can see that we actually violate the phase margin by two degrees for the third test case and only are in the stable, um, stable region still for the second test case. So this is actually not a lot. And here, of course, are the, um, the results of our laboratory measurements. So of course, as we expected, the test case one was zero millihenry. We can see the current at the point of connection injected by the inverter in time domain on top. So we see more or less a very smooth sinusoidal signal. And when we look at it in wavelet domain, so we see on the basically on the y-axis the frequency and on the x-axis over time 200 milliseconds we can see that basically only the fundamental frequency at around 50 Hertz is present. So it's a very low, um, a very low distortion that we can see here. When we're looking now at the second test case with a 2.3 millihenry, we expected a noticeable distortion. And again, we can see in the current already a noticeable distortion. Um, I hope this is visible that specifically at the maxima of the sign, we see basically that this is not a nice sign shape anymore. And even better in the wavelet domain, we can already see a present component in the 500 Hertz area. And then if we go to test case um, 3.2 millihenry, so the third test case, we can see a very high distortion in the beginning that eventually leads to the shutdown of the inverter. And we can see in time domain and also in wavelet domain how the inverter shuts down. Again, we can see that the frequency, the dominant frequency component was actually, again, these 500 Hertz. So having validated actually everything, um, we performed more measurements in the laboratory, assuming now that the theory was correct. So we didn't do the entire stability measurement for all devices, but we actually performed um, only the theory and individually measured um, the inverters. So here we can see six commercially available um, inverters for PV applications as previously, and now measured into the frequency range up to 39 kilohertz. And um, also on the left, we saw the 10% of the rated power and on the right, the 100% of the rated power. So at different power levels, as we know that sometimes this can actually have an effect on the inverter characteristic. If we specifically look now on the left at the 10% rated power, we can see that the purple, um, let's say the purple inverter actually is changing its characteristic 
with compared or compared to the right side, so to the 100%, for example. And I will um, come to that later again when we um, actually have the results of the analysis. So here again is actually a grid impedance measurement um, that has been done by a colleague. Um, the previous in the previous uh, presentation, I think it was asked if such measurements or if in general measurements of uh, network impedance and so on are maybe available. I think this was more with regard maybe to the ambulance study. Um, but the reference here has actually been done at the Institute and they have actually measured um, network impedances. So we're talking about um, 200 loop impedances in public low voltage networks in the Dach CZ. So we're talking about Germany, Austria, Switzerland and the Czech Republic. And most of them, so to say 75% have been measured at junction boxes and 25% at the bus bars. And um, in about 80% of these cases, we found that the resonance peak was between 600 and, uh, hertz and 1.8 kilohertz. So um, in the next step, we use the data that has been done in the public, um, uh, uh, at public low voltage and public low voltage networks and compare them to our uh, laboratory measurements from the inverters where we have identified these inverter characteristics. And when we applied the Nyquist criterion as previously introduced, so the amplitude criterion and the phase margin criterion, we didn't find any critical grid inverter combination. So when we basically applied the criterion of the inverter impedance and the network impedance, it was all fine. However, now we have to be a little bit careful with the uh, performed measurements. So the grid measurements have not directly been taken at the customer terminals where the PV inverters are usually connected um, because as I said, they were, for example, taken at the bus bar and so on. So, um, so the thing is that the grid connected devices might actually affect the network impedance. For example, that we have a more capacitive uh, character. And also the change of the impedance seen by the inverter can be dependent on the daytime. So what we said is um, we want to have an additional uh, phase margin of let's say 30 degrees. This is just a, a value that we pick, let's say randomly and needs to maybe a little bit more um, uh, validated and justified. Um, but this was just for the sake of a theoretic, um, yeah, for a theoretic study. And then we performed everything again. So this is now with the um, additional phase margin. And now actually we can see critical sites for both cases, the 10% rated inverter power and the 100% rated inverter power. And even more, what was a little bit um, more interesting even than only that is that we can see that if we operate the inverters at 10%, we actually find more network impedances as critical than with 100% of the rated inverter power. And this actually fits together with studies of the um, current field measurements where where it has been found that often in low power, um, let's say in the low power operation of a certain device, it is more critical to see a stable behavior. So um, what we did then to actually finally assess the individual inverters with the set of uh, impedance measurements that we have done all over the same, was actually um, we defined a certain grid compatibility index, which was supposed to um, assess the robustness of inverters with regard to the grid inter integrations. So this what we call GCI, so grid compatibility index, um, is calculated only by one minus the critical measurement sites divided by the total number of measurement sites uh, that we studied. So basically, on the right side, we calculated or we have the results of the calculation and one means it's actually the best performance. So one means that in no grid of all these um, studied grids in inverter became unstable. So it was always stable. Whereas on the other side, we marked this inverter five, for example, only in 92%, 92.5% actually this inverter was stable, but they were actually 7.5% of uh, networks where this inverter could actually sometimes have a critical operations. 
So just to summarize briefly what we have just uh, heard is basically we have performed an harmonic stability assessment of commercial available photovoltaic inverters, all uh, black, black box based. So we don't require any information or any understanding about the internal control or the hardware. We have validated this um, theory in the laboratory. And then of course, next step was to take it to probabilistic means. So we have studied it with regard to actual uh, public low voltage grids and the network impedances of those measured in the field. Um, and then also provided the first index to see if we can assess individual inverters based on this uh, stability analysis. So for future work, we are still, let's say, uh, trying to expand the database with regard to grid measurements and inverters, because of course we need both sides to have a more reliable set or an even larger set. And of course, study individual nonlinearities of inverters. So to say, for example, the specific dependency of the DC power level, is it linear or is it nonlinear? How do we integrate these? And are the respective representations of our inverter by let's say only changing the DC power level uh, correct and uh, complete. So for now, this is actually everything for the presentation, but I'm sure there might be questions or I'm of course open to questions and want to give back the, yeah, the word to the chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kaufold. Uh, the first question is from Professor Kai. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, for the very good presentation. I have only one question according to the point two, I think, but uh, I cannot see your uh, page number, the slide number. I cannot oh, see. yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah this, this is the one. I, I mean, the third one, the case three. Uh, what happened? Uh, and uh, and then the, 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 the converter shut down. Is it because of the resonance? Because uh, to be frankly, if I see this current, it's much more better than some of the converter output current, really. <laughs> and I cannot see any problem over current, over voltage, or resonance. Why it shut down? Okay, so um so maybe I can um, step back a little bit. So this is basically where we had the impedance test case, uh, the test case, the individual test, test case and changed the impedance. Yes. So um, the red one here, I don't know if you see my mouse. Um, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So you see it's 182 degrees. Yeah. So this means actually that um, the criterion is violated. And also we see that there's actually an um, increase of the network impedance. So what this at the same time means it's, uh, barely visible in the FFT, we have actually analysis, uh, analyzed it a little bit more in detail, but you see that actually the intersection here moves a little bit from the second test, uh, test case um, to the third. So it goes down in the lower frequency range. And this is actually what we try, or what I tried to depict here a little bit too. So the moving into the lower frequency range means actually also um, that we're going more into the direction of the control where the control is active. So we can assume that the bandwidth of the control is only a couple of hundred hertz. So let's say maybe 500, 600, 400. This is a little bit um, depending on the manufacturer. So the more we move this, uh, this first part of the Nyquist, so basically this uh, intersection of the impedance, um, the more we come to a critical phase angle. So here we see that actually the, the difference basically becomes larger when we move down. So it becomes more critical. And um, now with regard to your question, um, I, wouldn't, um, uh, I wouldn't call it a resonance per se, because the thing is resonance uh, will typically, or can typically mean a very high, um, let's say a high, um, high response. Voltage, high current, yeah. Exactly, but what we're talking about here is actually that um, it's actually, um, let's say um, a positive feedback. So basically we increase in excitation. So this is basically what we see here a little bit. We have a, a periodic excitation here, yeah. but um, over time, eventually, since the damping is so low, um, we saw it's only um, here, it's only violated by two degrees, right? So this is not a lot, but eventually over time, this will increase. So the damping is not present anymore. And an excitation that we have periodically here will actually increase over time the, um, the current response. And then eventually here, this is basically the critical point where the damping is not, it's not present over the whole time, but the current response on this frequency, so on the 500 Hertz is so large that the inverter decides to shut down. Okay. We 
we don't exactly know if this is actually of overcurrent protection or other reasons, okay. but, uh, but we can say that this is actually, um, this interaction with the control is actually causing that. Okay. Okay, thank you. It could be a controller stab stability problem because uh, from this curve, I cannot see any overcurrent. I, I, I also cannot assume any over over voltage, but I think it's something related to the to the to the controller st stability. But I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question, Professor Kai. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kaufold. Uh, I suggest to continue. Ah, Dominic, I wanted to ask you to to take over, but you also have a question. Okay, one remark about the converter stopping. It's also probably the problem with the PLL getting lost, lost uh, or losing the synchronization because you don't have a sinus anymore, very far from the sinus. So that could be one good reason to stop the converter. But I had a question, do you have many cases this study that you uh, triggered here, do you have many cases in, in, in Germany of uh, inverters stopping by themselves um, due to these instability problems? Um, so the literature research um, states that also for the Netherlands, and it has actually come from the railways first time. So the Swiss, uh, Swiss railway grid already like a couple of, I think even 10 or 15 years ago, um, in Germany, it's difficult to hear reports basically about it because often it's critical in the low power range and then someone would have to report, of course, the problems. So um, most, uh, let's say, cases where I'm aware of is more for um, larger parks because then they actually perform a study. But um, there are cases not only in Germany, but also in Switzerland, for example. There was a study called Spring Grid, for example, where they studied that also. Okay, yes. I, I don't have a number, sorry. You were involved in that project, yes. Ah, perfect, yeah. Oh, fair, all right, all right, I see. <laughs> so um, I don't have a number for how many cases we have, but we have heard about um, yeah reports regarding that. Uh, 